theoretically, and actually as a matter of law, equal purchasing power is supposed to be the standard among all forms of the United States currency. In fact, the Secretary of the Treasury is required by law to exchange gold certificates with the Federal Reserve in order to maintain the equal purchasing power of all forms of the United States currency. That's an exact quote. Yeah. All right? And you know what the standard is for that exchange? Yeah. 42 and 2 ninths dollars per ounce oh, of gold. Oh, yeah, 42 42, 22 42, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22 yeah, right, yeah, the exactly. irrational number. 42 and 2 ninths. All right. So obviously the Secretary of the Treasury is not doing his job there. Well, mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve is not doing its job, but the two of them are not doing their job together. All right. So if there is a speculative aspect to different forms of the United States currency, we have to trace it back to the Treasury. Mm -hmm. It's the Treasury's problem. So here we have a situation where the Treasury is coming to people and saying, look, we're going to tax you on an appreciation that is caused by the failure of the Secretary of the Treasury to perform his duty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I find that rather ironic. Yeah, it is terribly <laughs> ironic. Um, does that authority to the Secretary of Treasury come from the regulate the value thereof clause of Article 1, Section 10? Well, uh, ultimately, well, ultimately, regulate the value thereof of Article 1, Section 8, uh, clause, Section 8 clause 5 yeah. of Congress's power. And you can trace it back to the 1933-1934 legislation under Roosevelt. Which was, that was... The, uh, well, first they had the gold seizure, and then they removed uh, uh, the gold clause contracts, and then they had the Gold Reserve Act of 1934, and that's the tie-in. All the gold was seized, put in the national gold stockpile, and then they issued gold certificates to the Federal Reserve, so there's a gold certificate account the Federal Reserve has, and supposedly the Secretary of the Treasury is to maintain this balance by buying and selling gold, because the Federal Reserve can also buy and sell gold. And there's this statutory requirement. And for a long time, it was $35, went up to 35 under Roosevelt. It was 35 until 1971. And then you had the series of acts that eventually brought it up to uh, 42 and 2 ninths, where it sat since when? Sometime in the 1970s. But if, during that whole period of time, up, certainly up to when it was $35 an ounce, yeah. we well, had no problem because there was this redemption going on. But when they stopped in 71, the redemption, now something else had to be done to maintain whatever that equilibrium figure was. And quite obviously, uh, it hasn't been done because what's the price of an ounce of gold in the marketplace today? 1500 and something. And that's bullion, not even coinage. Right. But coinage would have a slight, slight premium yeah, because of the fabrication costs something. and everything involved right. in it. No one has called the Secretary of the Treasury on the carpet, no. though, for decades. Why no. not? No, no. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe they thought this is one of those losing arguments. But I bring the issue back to the states. You have half a dozen of the states set up an alternative currency, and the Treasury then says, well, we're not going to recognize, we're going to continue to tax this or whatever. They're going to give them some kind of trouble. And the states say, well, fine. You don't want to negotiate this. We're going to take this to the Supreme Court of the United States, original jurisdiction, which means we get in right away. The Supreme Court becomes the trial court. And mm -hmm. we're going to raise this issue, among others. Mm -hmm. And let's see where that goes when the public is now finally recognizing that you have a collapsing currency. Which way is the Supreme Court going to go when the states are saying, well, this is the alternative that's going to save us economically, and the Treasury is saying no on the basis of essentially rogue action because they're not following their own statutes. Yeah. Is, is this actually a way to develop competing currencies without actually having a specific piece of legislation allowing currencies to compete with one another? Well, that's actually my hope, what will happen, that the state sets up an alternative currency for its own use, its own citizens' use. And it's an alternative currency. I'm not proposing that the states say that Federal Reserve notes can no longer be used or that private transactions couldn't be made in uh, euros or, or whatever. This is an alternative currency, and the state, to some degree, at least initially, will start using it for its own purposes. And then, once it's available to people, competition sets in, because now they'll actually have a choice. And if they're watching a crumbling Federal Reserve system and a highly depreciating paper currency, here's the option. It's an insurance policy, in essence. Yeah. And I don't think it's really an insurance policy in that sense, in the sense of my hitting the little blind girl in the wheelchair, because I think this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. This is essentially a sure bet. But our problem now is we have no such alternative. And as you said earlier, if there's a major currency collapse, then there will be social dislocations, economic dislocations, political radicalism. I mean, everything comes out of Pandora's box at that stage. And we have to be prepared for that. Yeah. And the scary thing is that when there is a monetary collapse, you can go either the right way, like uh, America did after the collapse of the Continental, or you can go the wrong way, which is perhaps what Germany did after the collapse of the Reichsmark in the 1920s with increasing fascism. Well, I don't know you, James, but the only example that I know of where you had 
a collapsing currency, political instability, and so forth that led to what we would consider to be sound government was the American experience. Yeah, that's the only one I'm I think aware the only of one well. I think in history. Yeah. Whether we do it again the yeah. second time when the dollar collapses or not. Well, pretty tough time. odds. I mean, if you don't have, <laughs> what are the odds on it happening twice? Uh, but that one, of course, was done at what we would call the national level. Because they, of course, they had the Continental Congress and they had the, the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and they gave us this mechanism through the federal structure, which includes the intermediate layer of the states. So actually, we may be better off in terms of institutional structures than they were, because it's already there. I mean, it's in the Constitution, the state governments are there, and I think the state governments have quite a bit more uh, of political credibility than the government in Washington. And as we mentioned before, well, there were 50 of them. Mm -hmm. So if some of them want to maintain the ostrich position, well, that's fine, but we can expect that some of the others will be a little more foresighted, a little more prudent. And I think once that happens and you actually have the ability to have competing currencies, because now the state's a pretty big institution economically, most of them, they play a fairly large financial role in their economies. Once that's there, I think the average person knows his own interests. Mm -hmm. If he has the institutional ability to take that action.